Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand, and I'm delighted to be over at the Worcester Art Museum today in uh, an exhibition of the works of Ron Rosenstock, who is an internationally known photographer. And the show that's here now is called Him to the Earth. And it's uh, more or less a mini retrospective of Ron's work. It opened on December 15th, and it will be here through March 18th. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron, we're so happy to be able to share your work with the Thank audience you, today. Thank you. Uh, it, the work is beautiful. It's very sublime and very spiritual. So do try to come over and see it. <clears throat> and uh, so would you consider this a retrospective of your work? or Not a complete retrospective. Um, the show was curated by David Ackman, who, who was absolutely wonderful to work with from, from beginning to end, and, and, it, and it still goes on. David came to my studio and looked through stacks of prints, stacks and stacks, and he chose work not from the perspective of being a, a, so much of, of a retrospective of work that he related to, you know, that he felt was unique and important and people should see it. So there are samplings of work from the last 40 years, but not a complete That's representation right. of right. all the various series you've done. Yes, yes. Ron has traveled the world over. He really is a world traveler, leading uh, workshops, I, yeah, photograph, yeah. photography Well, workshops. we used to call them workshops. Okay. Now, workshops uh, are very specific to a certain kind of workshop, like say, nude in landscape, you know, or, or, or a, a certain kind of uh, technical kind of thing of working with a certain kind of camera or, or whatever. We now call them photo tours, okay. which opens it up to anyone who wants to, to do a lot of photography, the kind of photography they enjoy doing. I don't dictate what people should photograph. I just take them to great places to photograph and, and answer any questions that they may have about their cameras. And they and can learn from mm. each other as well. They learn from each and other, experience. sure. That's and I do a lot of teaching in the evenings as well. I bring my computer and projector, so I do slideshows. And uh, lately I've even taken to bringing a little Dexter mat cutter and showing folks how to finish their prints off nicely. And, and um, I've gotten very good at um, what's called Silver SilverFX Pro, which is a, a NYX software. It's kind of like Photoshop, only it's really geared. It's, it's almost like darkroom work for a computer. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it has well, just what you need. I wanted to ask you about that because you started <clears throat> off using the B, the eight by ten. Oh yes. So. Uh, yes. Oh gosh, yes. How did? When did that go by the wayside? Well, okay. I kind of started with eight by ten. Most people start with a little camera and work their way up. I did the opposite. I worked with a great big camera and worked my way down. <laughs> But uh, I was most impressed by the work of Edward Weston, and this goes back to my high school days, you know, in the late 50s. And I saw a show of his at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And uh, in fact, I had this conscious moment when I saw a photograph of his of a cabbage leaf. I saw it on the wall, and I came on it, and I swear I saw it breathe. You know, it was just one of those, it just called to me. There was just something magical about it. and. Um, I became very interested in Weston and the way he worked, and it was, he just made contact prints from an 8 by 10 negative. And a contact print basically is, uh, on, a, on a countertop you'd put the, the, the piece of paper, the light sensitive paper, the negative on top of that, and a piece of glass on top of that, so it's and shine a light one through to it. One. Yeah, exactly. So it was exactly the same size as the negative. Mm -hmm. Now I did that for about 20 years. I was really influenced by his work, so I did the same kind of technique until I, I got an 8x10 enlarger, actually through the museum when they didn't have any use for it. And uh, I got that enlarger probably in the mid-70s sometime. But before that, I was only doing 8x10 contacts. And, and of course, wonderful. the uh, digital, now you're doing mm -hmm. digital yeah, oh primarily. Yes, yeah, yeah, primarily, yeah. or are you still using film as no, well? No, I'm not using film at all. OK. Yeah, we, we could probably talk for a few hours about the transition. But I, I could try and sum it up. Um, after working with the large format for many, many years, uh, as I got older, the camera got heavier. I don't know how that happened. Some kind of mysterious thing was going on. So I went down to 4x5, which is still considered large format, but it's much easier to deal with. And over time, I guess this started 
10, 15 years ago, people started going on my photo tours and they were bringing digital cameras. Now, I'm the expert. I'm supposed to know everything there is to know about photography. People pay money and to travel with me. Digital is a whole nother ball of wax. It was, exactly. <laughs> it was so new, and I think I better find out about this. Now, it, it took a while, and it, it took a few years, you know, until I really became comfortable with digital. It took a few more years until I really found my vision again, mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a different tool to work with. You know, the, the product is the same, but you have to go around the barn in a very different way. But all in all, you find that it offers you more uh, flexibility and potential and expressive... Uh, it does now. It yes. does now. When I first started, it didn't. Yes. It didn't. In fact, for the longest time, I would always bring my large format camera on a photo tour and a digital camera. You know, because I didn't have the confidence in the digital camera, and I didn't think I'd really go in that direction. Now, are you printing your own uh, images well, at this point? Or? No, uh, I stopped shooting film. Uh, although I, most of this show is made from film, but there, are, uh, there are about five images that are purely digital in this show. And if I didn't point them out, you would, you, you couldn't even tell. Of course, yeah. there's no way of knowing. And and but, a fact um, is, a, a large photograph like this too to develop with film yeah, in exactly. a bath of this size I, would be yeah. really cumbersome. So let me answer that first question about okay. printing my own, which is important. Um, most professionals, uh, whether you work for National Geographic or and even Nature magazines, or you, you, you're doing just a lot of digital work, would work with a highly trained and, and an excellent printer. And I work with a man right here in Worcester, one of the best in the world, uh, uh, one of the best kept secrets too. His name is Mark Doyle at Autumn Color Digital Imaging. And uh, I think we're gonna do a show on him. You really should. Yeah. You know, he, he's, he's outstanding. He used to do the dye transfer work like Elliot Porter and Ernst Haas. He's done work for work NASA. Is magnificent. He's done a lot of museum work for museums all over the country. Now to make a print 30 inches wide, this is he scanned my 8x10 negative to make this print and, and from a high res scan, you know, made a print 30 inches wide. I could never have done that in the darkroom. And the yeah. quality is superb. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just well, you as know, good as going superb. Back to, um, going back to the idea that he's right in Worcester, I did want to mention that although Ron is a world traveler and leads all these tours around the world, he is also our local pride because he lives right here in Holden and he's been involved in the Worcester area as you've been getting a sense of for many, many years. And what got you started in nature photography? Well, as I mentioned, you know, Weston's work really moved me and some of um, Weston sand dunes particularly moved me. I could have a whole show of just dunes now because I loved his dunes and I, I'd never had the opportunity until recently. I also work in Death Valley, so uh -huh. I, I shoot the dunes in Death Valley yeah. and in Morocco as well. And of course it's all these marvelous abstract shapes that uh, speak to you in a very absolute kind of way, yes, without yeah, any yeah. narrative. You, you, I never see any figures in your compositions. It's always these very formal, elegant forms of nature. Well, Are there, ever there, it, there is a photograph uh, in the hall here of Bodhanath, uh, which is a, a, um, a, a Buddhist stupa in uh, Kathmandu. And there's a little monk kind of walking through the bottom of it. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I actually could have a whole show of people also. Really? Yeah, I do a lot of uh -huh. uh, portraiture uh, in Peru and also in Morocco. Well, you know, it's interesting though, when you put people in pictures and props and even there aren't even man-made things in most of your pictures that that's are in true. this show. That's true. It's really about elements of nature that are timeless and, yes. and eternal. Yes. And yes. I yes. love yeah. that quality yeah. of your work where it's always going to be that way. You know, it just exists eternally as this nap this Yeah. In fact, I'm glad you said that cuz it, it it reminded me of um, something that I've said to my students when I was at Clark about different photographers describe their work in different way or the moment of making the exposure like Cartier-Bresson talks about the decisive moment Edward Weston 
called, uh, had a phrase, the flame of recognition, ooh, which is kind of neat. Ooh, like that an lovely, awakening. Yes. Like it speaks to you. And, oh, I, and I love I've that. Flame of recognition. Flame of recognition. And for myself, I've used the expression, the eternal moment. Wow. I like that. I like that a lot. So there really are different things which drive artists and getting at something which is sublime, meaning that which is hmm. grand and over, you know, sort of uh, overwhelms us with its awesome mm -hmm. qualities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really something worth experiencing. I want to hear more about that maybe when we look at the photographs. Yeah. Um, so you were uh, just a few more questions about your influences. I know you said you can, were uh, speaking with uh, Ansel Adams and uh, studied with Minor White at MIT. Yeah, yeah. So uh, these were some of your early influences. Yes, and Paul and Caponegro as well. Paul Caponegro. Yes. Yeah. And um, how was it you went to Ireland. Uh, you well, know, this I, show has a lot of the images of yeah, Ireland. Yeah, a lot from Ireland. And I, uh, in fact, one of my books is called The Light of Ireland. The first book that I published is just images from Ireland. That's pretty much all my large 8 by 10 negatives uh, that made that book also. But I got excited about Ireland in, in the early 70s, late 60s, around that point when I met Paul Caponegro because he had recently returned from photographing in Ireland for over a year. He had a National Endowment for the Arts uh, grant and, and worked there for over a year and brought back just the most wonderful photographs. And I, and in fact, they were so wonderful that John Sarkowski, who at the time was the, the curator of, the, of MoMA in New York City, gave Paul his first big one-man show. And I saw that show and it just blew me away and I kind of fell in love with Ireland. Just the wonderful open spaces and that kind of, as we mentioned, that eternal feeling of it's been this way for eternity. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and it's so much of Ireland that it's just wide open. And I love photographing the ocean. I you also see, love the, the thing about Ireland, Ireland that it's yeah. not new and improved. You know, <laughs> when I first Ireland's went to changed Ireland, quite a bit. I know, but there are still many places yeah. where you just love the fact that it's not new and improved. Yeah, yeah, the west of Ireland is You know what, let's, uh, let's look at some of the images. Sure. Now, this is a picture of Ireland, is it not? Yes, yeah? yes, yes. It was a, uh, one, of those, one of those days where the sun is in and out, and I photograph in all kinds of light. It doesn't matter to me, you know, uh, way, way back, you know, George Eastman said the sun had to be over your left shoulder to take a photograph. Not so. <laughs> I photograph, sometimes it's pitch black. I photograph, like, there's photographs in the show of uh, Venice uh, at night, you know, at St. Mark's, just with street lights. This was a diffuse kind of lighting. The sun was behind the clouds. These are mussel shells. It was low tide. And I saw this sort of geometric shapes here, and I positioned myself just, you know, where I have one triangle in back of the other, and the sun is there, so it's just sort of illuminating all these wonderful shapes. What always impresses me about your work is the design. You really have a sense for composition and design. I try very hard to have all the pieces just fit just fit until it, it feels comfortable. You know, it's a, it's a very uh, kind of right brain kind of thing. You have to sort of turn off the left brain that is sort of orchestrating and telling you what to do all the time and sort of listen to your heart and kind of to commune with what's out there, to kind of feel the spirit of the place. I mean, this really is my sort of driving force, you know, in, in, in photography. Well, it comes through. When you look at the photographs, I really am able to share a little bit of what you experienced on that location. And at that moment, you know, you were mm -hmm. talking about these special moments mm -hmm. and, yes. and uh, some of the things you tell your students. Uh, yes. Well, there's one special quote that I, I always mention at all of my photo tours and every time I give a, a, a talk to an audience. It's a, it's a special quote by the very famous artist Pablo Picasso. And Picasso said that art washes away from the soul the dust of everyday life. Now think about that. Art washes away from the soul 
the dust of everyday life. What do those words mean? If I asked everybody watching this show to give me a definition of art, you'd all give me you know, a different definition, or soul for that matter. You know, we don't really know. Philosophers discuss this. What is art? What is soul? I, I just want to share with you for a minute my personal definitions of, of, of art and soul because it's really the reason why I photograph. To, to, ex to give you the definition of, of art, well, you know, it's, it's, it's not that easy. In some cultures, like in Bali, which everything is artistic, in the Balinese language, they don't even have a word for art because it's everything. How do you define everything? Um, uh, you know, for me, um, it's, it's ba basically striving to reach my highest potential. And, it's, and the, the art is actually the result of that attempt to commune with my highest potential. It's giving it physical form. It's, it's giving it physical form. I mean, there's so many artists, e even musicians. Like, the, there's a famous uh, story about Pablo Casals. Pablo Casals, as you all know, was a, a very famous cellist. And when he was 70, he was interviewed, and he said he had learned so much about music, if he died tomorrow, he'd die a happy man. When he was 80, he was interviewed again, and he said, if someone had told me when I was 70 how much more there was to learn between age 70 and 80, I never would have believed them. When he was 90, he was interviewed again, and he said, it's been the greatest 10 years of my life in terms of the of learning uh, and, uh, and appreciating and just the subtleties of, of, of my music is, is you know, so just been fabulous. So when you look fabulous. at Picasso's statement, what it is that we're, it's, it's, it's having that dust swept from our eyes and having a direct experience of this sublime. <coughs> and uh, you can imagine that the more intense that experience comes, the more we see and the more we're able to get into the photograph, really. Sure. Now, this is a piece that uh, is from the Czech Republic, yes, did you yeah. say? Yes, it's from the Czech Republic. You know, we, we talked before about me starting in Ireland, and a lot of people associate me with Ireland. But, you know, because of, you know, how life takes you in different directions, I now lead photo tours in many, many different countries, including the Czech Republic. And this is actually a, a fairly recent image. It's an infrared image, which I could do a whole program on talking. If I do do a program uh, that I present to camera clubs on infrared photography, you know, explaining about the difference. I mean, you see the sky that would normally Almost be blue black. is black, and the and leaves come out white. Why is that? This is because the camera is converted to accept only infrared light, which is below the visible spectrum. Our eyes do not see infrared. Bumblebees see infrared, and that's why they can zoom in on a flower. You know, like we don't see x-rays, but we know they're there. We don't see microwaves, but we see the result of microwaves. Infrared also re responds to heat, and like the leaves give off more heat, so they become lighter. Well, you know, that kind of gives you the feeling of the mysticism of these, because you know that that sap is rolling in those leaves and, and giving off energy. The juice is yes, yes. giving <laughs> off its life into it's, the a, it's another way of, of seeing things. So I'm, I'm very wow. excited about it. I do a lot of infrared now. I actually, I have to tell you, I mean, this is an interesting story. You know, I, I, some of you may or may not know that Minor White shot infrared film you know, back in the 50s and 60s. In fact, infrared was first invented in photography about 1934. There was a Leica camera, actually, that first came out. A lot of people don't know about infrared, but now, digitally, it's so easy to get a camera converted to do, you know, to be a dedicated infrared camera. What's your favorite place that you ever photographed? Like, the what was the most inspiring or the most uplifting, well, you know, something that just stands no, out? I, I, I hate to disappoint you, Sue. Where, where I am is the most exciting place at, at the moment, always, yeah, always. I am, I, where I am, I'm present th to that. I always love the quote that uh, Walt Whitman said, I open my mouth where I happen to be standing. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, it's all magic, yeah. it's yeah. all wonderful. It is, it's it all is. And you, you, get, you go with the flow, yeah. you know? So yeah, absolutely. I was very fortunate, and, and I, I'd like to just mention something, if I may, 
Um, if anyone were interested in, in these photo tours that I do all over the world, very easy to go online. The website is, once I say it, you'll probably never forget it because it's just phototc.com. That's www.phototc.com. That means the photo tour collection.com. So check it out. See what I do. Also, you know, this is just a fraction of my work. On my website, I have lots, lots more work, which and is give just my name. Just which look is up just Ron my name. Rosenstock. Yeah, ronrosenstock.com. So it's and also you can see very easy. many of his diverse series that uh, you know we can hardly show the tip of the iceberg. Yes, and I here. also, because of digital, I uh, started shooting color. And I did a number of uh, number of years. I just worked in color. I mean, as the teacher. How do you feel about color versus black and white? Well, I explored color, and I did a lot of work in color, and I still shoot some color. Like in January, when I'm photographing in Iceland doing the aurora borealis, I'm not going to do that in black and white. <laughs> I mean, there certain you go. things cry out sure. for color. I have a whole series of beautiful rainbow photographs from Iceland. Because around every corner, there's another waterfall and rainbow. Again, it's, 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 like, it's, it's like going into some mystical land, some kind of hobbit land you know, in Iceland. The it's, land it's, that uh, time forgot. The yeah. land that time forgot, exactly. Wow. You, you can see why Jules Verne kind of got excited about that. The timeless. So. You know, I was wondering, does landscape that involves architecture or some sign of the human presence, like something man-made, is that less appealing for you? Is that less timeless? So it's all appealing to me. I could have a show just on architecture. I've been photographing for almost 50 years. Okay. In fact, I, I, the only commercial photography I did, the only commercial photography that I was successful at, <laughs> I tried a few, but I was an architectural photographer. My primary uh, uh, company that I worked for was called the Architects Collaborative. This was founded by Walter Gropius, and this is in, in Cambridge, and this was back in the 60s. In fact, I photographed Little Center at Clark when it was first built, and then I started teaching there so 20 years later. So you can find that, that uh, experience, that transcendental moment in any subject. Oh, yes. But primarily, you're working with these timeless nature I, subjects. That is m the main thing, yeah. yes. Yeah, nature perhaps is number one. Um, but I do, a lo I do a lot of work also with ancient monuments, whether it's stones or ancient abbeys. You know, I, I, uh, in, in Bhutan, those wonderful ancient Buddhist, they call them zangs, we call them monasteries. There's, uh, they're, they're all over the place, and there's, there's, each one is magnificent. Oh, you've done New Zealand and all Oh, New Zealand is great for landscape. Yeah. You know, the people are just and like us. Monumental monumental forms and yes. mountain ranges. Oh yeah, Milford Sound. I really wanted to show the audience some of your uh, books. You actually have four books out, yes. don't you? Yes, yes. And what are the, what are, this one is uh, Hymn to the Earth, mm -hmm. and is primarily Ireland? No, this, this particular book uh, has work from all of my destinations. And it also has uh, wonderful poetry that was written specifically for each image in the book by a very good friend of mine whose name is Gabriel. Believe it or not, his last name is Rosenstock. I couldn't believe that when I read that in the uh, cover of the, the book. Well, Gabriel is actually a very well-known Irish poet. He lives in Dublin. He was, he was born in Ireland, and he's also one of the foremost authorities on the Irish language. He's published over 30 books just in the Irish language, but a lot of his poetry is in English as well. This particular book was the, um, I, I guess, uh, you know, what really motivated uh, the museum to, to have a show with the, the same title of Hymn to the Earth. And uh, the cover is a, a, a photograph from uh, Milford Sound in, I, in uh, New Zealand, excuse me. Ah. So I have work from Morocco and from Ireland and from Italy and, and from uh, India and, and Nepal and from, from so this book is quite diverse in the images, and then your other books are? The other books are more specific. I have a book called The Light of Ireland, which is just landscapes from the west of Ireland. I have another book, which I love, called Chiostro, Photographs of Italy. Chiostro in Italian means cloister. 
So I use the word as a metaphor, meaning sort of a place of meditation. It's 90% architecture of the churches and, and also of, of the wonderful landscapes in Tuscany. Um, this is a stunning uh, this image is, yeah, of Makras Abbey. Uh, extremely spiritual and uh, I, I'll, I'll just read one of Gabriel's poems because what astounded me when I was reading through this book yesterday, as a, uh, again after a long time, I uh, realized that the poetry was so specific to the image and so perfectly matched. And when I asked Ron about it, he said he wrote the poems for the images, which really shows in the, in the book. Uh, and he writes a lot of haiku and he says, muttering in Latin on his daily rounds, the Abbey Ghost. And you can just feel that uh, as, uh, as you look at the image. And some of the ones about the, the stones or the one with the uh, life in the trees um, or this one, on her way to us, the goddess rested here 10,000 years ago. It was sunlight sort of dancing through a bush and the wind blew the bush a little bit. Just a moment. So it, it created a glow. And a yeah. vibration of life and mm. wonderful. Again, nature kind of pointed the way. Uh, or this one that oh, says. This is a lovely one. Yes. It says, this one of, it says, with what precision light descends after a long journey. That you know, right on the floor. And thinking that the yeah. light is coming millions and millions and millions oh, of miles. From the sun. You know, just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so, so this book is available in the store, is uh, it Yes, not? all four books are available at the museum gift shop right here at the Worcester Art Museum. Well, they're just marvelous, and I've enjoyed this so much. I'm going to really share it with some of my friends Thank as you, well. Sue. Thank you. And it's been a wonderful experience talking to you, and I hope you'll all come and see the show, which is here till March 18th. Thank you so and much. And don't Sue. forget to look at Ron's website. And thanks a million for spending your time. Thank you, my pleasure. We'll look for you again next time.